Lesson number 12. Uh, we're talking about witnessing tonight. I talked a little bit about this a week ago uh, in, uh, in, my, in Sunday school when I filled in for Brother Walker last week. I talked a little bit about this from a, a pandemic perspective, and so we'll, we'll be able to tie in a little bit of that tonight uh, as, we, as we go forth through. Let me have a word of prayer, and then I'll get right into the lesson here tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the uh, time we have. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to gather and worship together. Lord, we thank you uh, that we have this time set aside. Lord, we pray for the young people. Lord, I think, I think this is such a crucial time each week for the children, for the youth, uh, to be able to meet together, to be able to uh, kind of interact with each other, to be able to learn. And uh, Lord, we just pray that it's a productive time and that they grow together and, and not only build relationships with each other, but most importantly, that they strengthen their relationship with you. Lord, we thank you for, again, we ask all this in your precious name. Amen. Lesson number 12 is witnessing for Jesus Christ. And so we're going to talk about uh, how to be a witness, what it means to be a witness. I think mostly the importance of being a witness uh, as we get into our outline tonight. So let's look at this. As a child of God, what responsibility do I have to tell others of my Savior? And so it begins, aren't you glad someone told you about Jesus Christ? Uh, different believers have different skills or different talents, different gifts, but we all have some responsibility there to be a witness of Jesus Christ in some way. This lesson is designed to show you your obligation, your Christian obligation to be a witness and provide us with some tips on how you can do this most effectively. And so I, I of course, I grew up in a Christian home. I uh, went to church from the earliest of ages. Uh, I remember the, the teacher, it was a Sunday night program, just like we're having tonight. It was a Sunday night program where the teacher on a Sunday night, um, uh, talked about salvation and the importance of making a decision for Christ and, and putting your faith and trust in Christ and explain that to my five-year-old little self. And uh, uh, I knew I hadn't done that, and uh, they led me to Christ that night. And I, I remember that. I remember that time. I remember that place. I remember that uh, setting uh, in particular. But uh, you know, maybe, maybe yours came later in life. Maybe yours was someone... Uh, that you met at work, someone that you met later on, someone that you, uh, came and uh, crossed your path, someone you met on an airplane, and they, they happened to witness and share the gospel. It's the first time you'd heard this, or first time you'd realized the importance of making that decision, and just the importance of having that interaction, of having that opportunity to share the gospel with someone, how important it was that someone did that for you and I, because that happened for us at some point, and uh, what, what, a, what a, a pivotal, important uh, moment that is in our lives. So we want to talk about that tonight. This is a ministry for every single believer, for everyone. And so if you see on the outline there, Roman numeral one, it's for all of us. The last instructions Christ gave his followers before ascending back to the Father was to teach and preach the gospel to others. So let's go to Matthew 28, 19. Of course, we're going to look at the Great Commission For years, the bumper sticker said it's the Great Commission, not the Great Suggestion. And so I think that's important. You know what I mean? This is, God's commissioned us to do this. He's uh, commanded us to do this. So Matthew 28, 19 and 20, the very last two verses of the Gospel of Matthew. We can find it at the end of Mark as well. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So it's his last command to take what I've taught you, followers, disciples, believers, take what I've taught you and tell others, share it with others. And I think we see the early church do that in a great way. I think the early church started off that in such a great um, uh, passion for Christ and, and, and spreading the good news. And we see in the book of Acts tells us they, I mean, they turned the known world upside down at that time. This is called the ministry of reconciliation in 2 Corinthians 5.18. Observe that this ministry is essentially a word ministry. So let's go to 2 Corinthians 5.18 and 19. 2 Corinthians 5.18 and 19. Uh, talking about the fact that, you know, these are, these are things we share in word Five eighteen and 19, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. He did what we couldn't do, and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation, to say that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, 
not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Uh, so explaining, again, that people are lost. I think that's a word you and I use a lot, but I think that's a, world, a word and a phrase and, and, a, and an idea that the world and the lost don't understand. Uh, what, are they, what do you mean they're lost, right? What do they need saved from? Uh, what, is it, what, is the, what is the problem with their current condition? I think in order for someone to be saved, they have to understand they're lost. They have to understand the state of their soul. They have to understand the, the need that they have. And so we need to be, we can only be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. And that's a ministry that he's given to us to tell others about him. And then God uses human instrumentation, you and me, to bring sinners to Christ. Um, since we're in 1 Corinthians, if you see that on your outline there, or, well, I'm sorry, we're in 2 Corinthians. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 4.15. Try to use a verse or two from each of these. But uh, 1 Corinthians 4 verse 15. It's hot up here. 1 Corinthians 4, 15. For though we have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers? For in Christ Jesus I've begotten you through the gospel. Uh, you know, Paul's talking about the association he had in leading and bringing others to Christ. And so God's given us that pivotal part, that pivotal role in his plan of redemption that we're the ones that are to share. You know, the Holy Spirit's doing the work, thank goodness. But it's our job to share, to, to speak, to give that track, to tell the good news of Jesus Christ. He's given us a, a role in his plan. He's given us a job to do. Uh, in the instruction, we're to teach, we're to preach, we're to share, we're to, we're to give that good news to those that we come in contact with. Roman numeral two on there, we need to be prepared to speak up. Many believers do not witness for Christ because they do not know how. It's our responsibility to witness for Christ. If it is, then it's your responsibility to prepare yourself for the opportunity when it should arise. And so 1 Peter 3.15 is going to tell us we should always be able and ready to give an account. Always able to give an answer. Always able to help when we're asked. Uh, uh, how you know how, If someone comes to us with a question of salvation and what that means and what is it you believe, we need to be able to give an answer for that and be prepared enough to give that answer to someone who is looking for the truth. So, letter A, we should know what the gospel, uh, it, uh, we should know what it is since it's the substance of our message. The gospel is defined in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians 15 the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You can have confidence that any sinner that truly believes the gospel will be saved. So to put their faith and trust in Christ and his plan and what, what he has provided and his free gift, and they can make a decision for Christ. So Romans 1, 16, I'll read for you. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first, also to the Greek. So it came to the Jewish people first, obviously, through Christ, uh, but it's been given to the entire known world. And so the gospel changes lives. And so when we're giving the gospel, what, what, a, what a powerful instrument it is that it can transform lives. Uh, the power of the Holy Spirit working through the gospel, the power of the word of God uh, as we share it with others can transform lives. So it's not... Uh, I think that's important because while God's given us the job of being the instruments of use, uh, he hasn't given us the responsibility to convince, right, to change. Uh, we don't save anybody. Uh, you know, it, it, that, hasn't been, that hasn't been put upon us. Uh, when I spent the 15 years working for the paint store, uh, you know, you were given a budget. You were given a list of uh, prospects, uh, you were given expectations, and it was your job to figure out how to get that guy that's buying paint at Home Depot to stop buying from Home Depot and buy paint from you. You know, it was your job to convince them. Uh, they gave you some tools to do it, but it was your job to get the, boy, God's expectation here is uh, the, the importance is much greater, but the work that is done is through the power of the gospel, the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the word of God. So thank goodness I'm not the one that has to convince someone I need to share. 
I need to share the gospel with them and let the Holy Spirit work in their lives. And that, that should help to relieve that stress level of sharing the gospel. Well, what if, they don't, what if they don't believe? Well, it was your job to tell, right? It's the Holy Spirit's job to do the work in their life. It's your job to tell. I think that we just understand our role in it and not to take too much upon our shoulders. That's not our responsibility. Uh, let her be there. You should be equipped with the word of God since faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's a good idea to get a small Bible, mark verses you might use to lead someone to Christ. You should also memorize important verses that will help in the event uh, that it, do, if you don't have a Bible with you. You can begin by memorizing the Romans roads. There's Romans 3.23, 6.23, 5.8, 10, 9, and 10. Uh, on the way here tonight, uh, we went over with Branson and Mason. We bring them on Sunday nights. And in their class tonight, they have, they have Bible verses that, that they want them to, to learn. Their Bible verse tonight was Romans 3.23. So we went over that in the car a number of times on the way here. Teaching them the Romans road. Uh, I, in, in all of my Bibles that I regularly use, this, this Bible here, Debbie and I were joking a little bit about this before the service. This Bible that I use up here in the pulpit uh, is not marked at all. This was Brother Wayne Wanger's uh, Bible uh, he had bought not too long before he passed away. But it's a, it's a large, large print. I don't know if it's this giant print or what they call it, but it's pretty large print. And it's easy for me to see up here. And so I use this for preaching. And you may notice, if you come through here, a lot of times this Bible literally stays here on the pulpit. Uh, I'll just leave it here because it's my preaching only Bible. Uh, it's not my notes. I, at home and in all my study and on my desk, I use a Thompson Jane reference Bible. And uh, my Bible that I use every day and all the time that I uh, um, uh, read out of, the one uh, 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 next to my bed at home, boy, I have, I have all those verses marked. I have the Romans Road marked from, from, from uh, verse to verse to verse to verse. So if I pick up the Bible I'm using every day, I can, I can, uh, I have a tendency for my, uh, for numbers to go blank in my mind. I, it, maybe it's just, I don't think that's just me. Uh, but I may know the verses by heart, but sometimes the references elude me. Numbers get all, I just get them out of order sometimes. I just do. I, uh, I, I don't know if I told you this or not. We were on vacation had a key code for the house. By the third day, I forgot it. Locked myself out. I, I, I couldn't get in. I, I, I had to wait for somebody else to show up to let me in my own house, you know, because I couldn't remember it. I had all the numbers. I just had them in the wrong order, you know. I'm just not, it's just not my thing, getting numbers in the right order, memorizing phone numbers. Thank goodness for caller ID and cell phones that keep all that stuff now, because I've never been good at that, right? So, so because I know that, I mark my Bible. I mark those references. I mark the Romans road. I mark all those things down. So, I mean, literally, if, if, if you took my Bible at home and turned to the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 1, it would say the Romans road starts in chapter 3, you know? And I go, because I it, it walks me through it. I'm never going to have to get stumped or, or, or forget or get the wrong passage or stumble around. It walks me through it. I've marked it that way. You can buy Bibles marked that way, but I've marked mine that way. And I think that's a good idea to make sure you know your verses and know the scriptures. And if you have a hard time remembering them, mark them down, write them down, write them in the, in the front or back of your Bible. Like keep a track with you that has them all marked down. Keep something with you so you know those verses. I think that's important because it's going to be when you don't expect it that someone comes to you and say, uh, I, at the paint store, about my 12th or 13th year, I had a manager from Lancaster. I'm working in Harrisburg. Manager in Lancaster called me and said, um, can I meet you for lunch? I need to talk to you about something. I'm like, sure. I'm thinking paint, you know. He's got some shed builder working up here or some home builder working up here and we're going to talk about a job, you know. So I leave from work and we go up, we have lunch in, you know, near, near, my, near my store and we sit down and he looked at me. He's like, my wife just left me. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I had no idea. And, and she left him He's the manager of the store. She left him for the assistant manager of the store. That got ugly. But my wife just left me, so we talked about that. He said, I want to know about your faith. He said, I know you're a Christian. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm hurting right now. I want to know about your faith. And so I was able, but you know what? I didn't walk in that restaurant with, with a Bible in my hand. 
because I didn't even know we were talking about the Word of God at that moment. I, I was in work mode. I had on my work uniform. So did he. You know, he wanted to know about my faith. And so we began to go, go through the Word of God, the Romans Road, talk about Scripture. He bowed his head. He prayed and asked Christ into his heart. And he's remained a, a, a pretty faithful Christian ever since then. I'm, I'm so glad to see God continuing to work in his life. But you never know when people are going to ask you. It's going to catch you probably off guard. It's not going to be when you expect it. Someone's going to just ask you out of nowhere. And to, boy, to be able to have that track, that Bible, those verses in your, in your, that you've put to memory that you can rely on to talk someone through what it means to be a Christian. I think that's so important. Just to have that knowledge. Always ready to give an answer. Letter C. Try to remember to take some tracks with you so that you can share these with people you attempt to witness to. I always, I always have them in my car. They're in the door of my car uh, or in the uh, little uh, console of my car, the white car I drive all the time. I always have tracks in there, uh, able to give them out. I usually have a done book or two. Uh, not, not long, uh, where was I? I was at the dentist. Some of you know my dentist. Uh, you go to the same dentist. Uh, and, and one of the receptionists there was asking me about the church and how's it going and what kind of church is that? And so I went and got the church brochure because the church brochure, when you open it up, is a track. I hope you know that. It's a track. I don't just want to publicize the church. We want to talk about Christ. So if you look on the front, it's like Cedar Hill Baptist Church. Open it up. It's all a track. On the back is some info about the church again, but it's a track. And so I, I had them in my car. I went and got one and gave it to them so they could see my church, but I gave them the gospel at the same time. And I hope you're, we're able to do that. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit. Letter D there, keep in mind that everyone needs to be saved, right? Learn to look on others as eternal souls that must be born again to be spared hell. We pre I preached on that uh, very thing this morning, the importance of being born again. Letter uh, number three there, objectives for presenting the gospel. There are certain truths that a lost person must be confronted with in order to be saved. So outline below are some basic steps. Letter A, you must show the person that he's a sinner, and that his sin separates him from God. He's got, they've got to know they're lost. They've got to understand their situation. They've got to understand that they are drowning without Jesus Christ. They have to understand that without Christ, there is no other, there's no hope. There's no other answer. There's no other way. They have to understand that their current condition in order to want to be saved. I think we looked at Nicodemus this morning briefly, but Nicodemus knew something was wrong, something was missing. You know, what, what, I know you're a great rabbi, I, I don't understand. Jesus talked about being born again, and he was, he was more confused for a moment before Jesus sat in, with him and, and talked him through it. We've got to understand our current condition, that we are lost without Christ, and we need to be able to present that to those that we come in contact with. Uh, let's look at Romans 3, 10. Uh, these are some of the verses... Uh, in the Romans road, uh, but I happen to still have my Bible there. So we'll look at Romans 3.10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. No one is good enough on their own to get to heaven. There's no one good enough on their own. Their, your righteousness is not good enough before God. Again, most people, most people that we talk to are consumed with this very thought. I think when I stand before God, my good will outweigh my bad, and I'll be okay. Boy, if you put your faith on that, you are doomed to an eternity of hell and damnation. That is not going to cut it. So people need to understand their current condition. There's none righteous. No, not one. Verse 23 in the same chapter, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned. So we're all in the same condition. We're all starting at the same place. Only Christ can be the answer to mankind's problem. All right, next page. Next page. The Ten Commandments serve as an excellent tool to illustrate man's sinfulness. And, and, and they do. Uh, just a great idea to be able to take someone and say, let's just go to the Ten Commandments and see how we do. You love, you love God with all your heart, so am I. Uh, you know, go down through the Ten Commandments and see how, how we rack up. And very quickly, we're going to see we fall short. We have some problems there. There's some great tracks and great tools that help, help us do that and share that with people. Letter B, you must show the sinner that there's a penalty for his sin and that that penalty is death. Romans 6.23 there, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we have to understand the consequences 
of being lost. It is spiritual death. It is an eternal death away from Christ. Let her see. You must show the sinner that Christ paid the penalty for his sin. There is an answer to the problem. Jesus Christ paid what we could not pay. It's important that they understand that Christ was sinless. That's what made him different. He wasn't just a good person. He wasn't just a good man. He wasn't just a good guy who died on their behalf. He was God. He was without sin. That's why his blood paid the price for our sin. We couldn't do it. We can't do it because we're sinners. So he was sinless and he paid the price. Letter D, you must show the sinner that salvation is by faith alone, apart from works. It's not by works, lest any man should boast. If you could pay enough, do enough, if you could win enough badges to get into heaven, then we could boast on that, right? You know, be, well, you know, I, I, you know, I, look at me, I'm, I'm the fastest to attain all my badges in my family, right? I, I, I'm the, I'm the quick, I, I attended church more than anybody else in, in, in my community. I've checked, made it into heaven. If it was our works, we could boast. If it was how much money we gave, people would outgive each other. Whatever it is, it would become a contest between humans. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. I've done it. I've earned it. I've won it. No. Only through Christ. Christ paid it. We didn't pay anything. He paid the price. You must show the sinner that they must receive Jesus Christ personally by faith. I want to look, let's look at these. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Romans 10, 9 and 10. I'm trying to stay close by here so you don't have to turn too much, but Romans 10, 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So it's a personal experience. It's a personal moment when someone comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so we know, we know that. I think if you're here tonight, we understand that. We're trying to, I'm trying to show the importance tonight of explaining that to someone else. Explaining these things that are very basic and foundational to us, but explain it to those that do not know Christ as Savior, maybe searching, maybe looking, maybe without hope. Uh, Roman numeral number four. And I have some, some other things I want to share tonight that are not on the outline, so uh, I don't want you to think I'm wrapping up here. Just <laughs> bear with me. Roman number four, uh, give your personal testimony. I think that's so important. One of the most powerful tools that we have at our disposal is our personal testimony. Even if you don't feel perfectly comfortable going systematically through the gospel, or if a, or if a person doesn't seem to be receptive to Scripture, you can tell someone what Christ has done for you. Over and over and over again, Scripture talks about us being a witness, a witness. And that's something that we should be able to relate to. Again, take a moment and think about what a witness is, the definition of a witness today in our current courtroom. The judge asked you to come in, or the lawyers, whoever subpoenaed you, and you've been asked to come in, you've been asked to give an account of what you saw, what you know, what you heard. The witness can't sit there and say, well, I think maybe, no, they don't care, they don't care what you think, right? They don't care what you heard, you know, about somebody else. What did you see? What did you hear with your ears? What did you see with your eyes? Are you an expert on this situation? They want to know your take on this. That's important because throughout Scripture, Christ tells us, be a witness. Be a witness unto me. Judah, Jerusalem, Judah, Samaria, uttermost parts, be a witness for me. And he's asking us to do what? Just tell others what Jesus did for you. Just tell them that. I've, I've heard, well, I heard a preacher preach on that a number of years ago that really got to me and transformed my thinking on that. But so many times I, I think we're, we're stymied, we're stopped from uh, telling others about Christ because we're like, well, I don't know if I have all the right answers. I don't want to tell them the wrong thing. And I, what, what if they ask me a question I don't know the answer to? And I, those are legitimate concerns. I understand that. But the great part is that according to the word of God, the expectation is, listen, just tell people what Jesus did for you. You can say, I, I think there's no harm in saying, you know, I, 
I don't have the answers to all that stuff. And you know, here's my pastor's card. <laughs> Call him. You know, I don't know. I don't know the answers to that stuff. But I can tell you what Jesus did for me. And people can't refute that, folks. Right? They can't really argue with that. They, they, they can't argue with what, how Jesus changed your life and what Jesus means to you. They, there's no argument against that. There's no way to refute that. And uh, there's a, a, I believe throughout Scripture, we see that over and over again. We even see in the book of Acts, some of the apostles, as they're called on trial to stand and give an account for what they uh, saw, they, they talked about the past the history of the God of Israel, but then they very quickly talk about what they saw in the life of Jesus Christ. They're like, well, you know, I mean, they were with him. They witnessed what he did. They saw, they know he raised from the dead. They saw the empty tomb. You know, they, they shared what they knew, what they saw, what they had experienced, what they knew to be truth. You couldn't argue with that. We need to be a witness. We can share uh, three parts there. They said your life before you got saved, your chance to tell someone that you were a sinner in need of a Savior. And boy, some have a more um, uh, decorated past uh, than others. I understand that. You know, some have, you know, God saved them from a life of dismay, a life of crime, a life of, of misery. God saved them out of, out of a pit. And uh, what a transformation that is. Some, like myself, you know, saved at an early age, always grew up in a, in a Christian home. I don't have a sordid past to look back on, but I can tell you this, without Christ, I was a sinner that needed a Savior, and there was still no hope for me. Letter number two, tell people how you got saved. It's your chance to tell someone that you trusted in Christ alone, and he saved your soul. When I give people my testimony, I tell them about when I was five years old at that Sunday night class. But then I tell them when I, made, when, I, when, I, when I found assurance of my salvation. When I was 13 years old at a uh, tent revival in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And sitting at that tent revival, I, I just began to understand the depth of the gospel. You know what I mean? I, when you're four or five years old, you don't really understand the depth of sin, the cost that Christ paid, uh, the importance of, of salvation. The, you, 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 didn't, you don't then, you probably, we still don't now, understand the enormity of eternity. Those things were just things that by 13 years old, I was like, that was a really important decision. I'm going to make sure that I'm saved. And so I remember the night. It was September the 12th, 1984. I was 13 years old, and I went forward at a tent revival and uh, got to the front. My dad was one of the guys up front helping at the tent revival. We had a national preacher preaching. He was up front helping. He saw me coming. He's like, what are you doing up here? You know? I was a preacher kid. I was a little goody-goody kid. You know what I mean? I never got in trouble. Like, what, what are you doing up here? I'm like, I want to make sure I'm saved. Dad's like, let's go. You know? And so we talked about it, and got saved and baptized that night in a cattle tank. That's what they had. You know, they used a cattle tank that night at, a, at the uh, tent revival. I, I remember all that. So, boy, I can tell people the, what, how important it was to me and, and, and how the decision I made and what, what was changed in my life that night. You can tell people, listen, what happened to you? Number three, you can tell people about your life since you got saved. Chance to tell someone that Jesus has made a difference in your life and that you know you're on your way to heaven. What happened? What all has changed? How has Christ continued to impact your life? What type of things? So here's a few tips. Letter A, mark your Bible. I talked about that already. We talked about that earlier. Letter B, pray for souls. You'll be much more conscious and burdened for the souls you pray for. Here, here's an interesting tidbit. If you're really interested in leading someone to Christ, ask the Lord to bring someone along your path that needs the Lord. See what happens. Try him. Try him. And let us see, pass out tracts. Even when you can't speak up, you can often pass out the gospel in print. So become familiar with tracts. So uh, here, here's where I got about 10 minutes left. I want to share, share some thoughts with you. It's 2020. In case you didn't know, it's a crazy year. 
things have changed. Uh, we're in the midst of COVID. And so I shared this with our Sunday school class for 45 minutes last week. Um, and so uh, some of, if you were in my Sunday school class last week, then you heard me say some of these things. But I think we, we, ha we have some unprecedented challenges of giving the gospel to people that we didn't have before. Um, we've lost some of our means as a church of evangelism, some of the things that we did, some of the, the methods that we used. A um, number of years, we haven't gone every year, but a number of years over the years here, we've, uh, we've, we've focused on a booth and stuff at the Dillsburg Farmers Fair. Well, that's not going to happen this year. Uh, a, a big part of our evangelistic outreach over the last 15 years has been our nursing home ministry. We haven't been allowed to go into nursing homes for the last six months, and I don't know when we'll be able to go again. Um, and so I, I think that's important. I, I think it's important to address the fact that this church, the people in this church, I, I would, didn't head up the nursing home ministries. People in this church headed up nursing home ministries, and we had different teams go to three different nursing homes every single week. So we had an aggressive nursing home ministry. We saw lots of people accept Christ through those ministries. And so an evangelistic effort of this church was nursing homes. That door is shut right now, and it might be shut for a long time. So my challenge to my, the Sunday school class last week and my challenge to us tonight is, well, we can't just sit around and wait for things to open up, right? We can't just sit around and say, well, I can't tell anybody about Jesus. It's too hard right now. I was, uh, I don't give too many illustrations on this, but I, I was at TAP this week and uh, had a, um, uh, on Thursday I was there, I had a gentleman make an appointment, want to meet me there. He's a church planner. He had been a missionary in Belize for a long time and has now planted a church in Idaho. And he's still working with that church and school that they started. They have a Bible college in Belize. And he was having us um, help send books and materials to this Bible college in Belize. It was a great opportunity. I was able to even um, uh, video chat with the, with the pastor, the national pastor in Belize, got to talk to him for a while live and, and uh, discuss what they needed, and then we packed up nine boxes of stuff. But the church planner that was there with me, his, uh, his father-in-law, if, if I used his name, many of you would know who he is. He's a fairly famous man in fundamental circles. But his father-in-law retired and moved to Idaho as well. And his father-in-law has been a, a, a um, for all his life, has been uh, a door-to-door -door soul winner. Knocking on doors, knocking on doors. That's what he's done for his whole life. But it's COVID now. You can't just knock on people's doors like you used to. You know? it just, that just doesn't go well. So his father-in-law, who is almost 80 years old, um, spends every weekend packing door hanger bags, 500 door hanger bags with tracks and Christian literature. And then every morning delivers 100 of them in his community and starts his day after he delivers 100 of them. So he does 100 on Monday and 100 on Tuesday until he's done all 500 on Friday, and then he goes about his day. He can't knock on doors, but he's still hanging tracks on 500 doors all around their community in Idaho. Uh, there's someone who found a problem and then came up with a way to circumvent the problem and try to keep giving the gospel out the best that we can. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I think our church has done a good job as a whole of using tracks. You know, I, I felt it has always been my responsibility as pastor to make sure you are armed with literature. So whether it's tracks or um, the uh, done books, or paid in full books. Uh, for a while, we used the DVDs um, um, uh, that were put out by Jim Shetler. But whatever we've had for a while, we keep them in stock, and you all use them, and we try to keep them, keep you armed with that stuff. But I know people, some of you are, but a lot of people aren't going out to eat like they used to. Uh, they're not seeing waitresses and waiters like they used to, and so we've lost that. Um, but what I'm challenging us as, as, as a whole, especially in light of all the scripture we just read. What can we do? What are we doing? What can we come up with? I, I'm burdened as a pastor that we can't just sit around and wait for COVID to blow away. 
to tell people about Jesus Christ because meanwhile, people are still dying and going to hell. And Dillsburg is still lost and in darkness. And I think we would find that there's more and more and more people without hope than ever before. And more people looking for answers than ever before. And more people scrambling and in depression and in despair than ever before. So what are we doing about it? You know, if our answer was, well, we're really good on tracks and we go to the Dillsburg Fair and we go to the nursing home, okay, well, those are gone. Right now they're gone. So what are we going to do this week? You know, what can we do? You know, I, I said, you know, I don't, I don't think putting a nice little Facebook post on <laughs> is enough to evangelize the world, if you know what I mean, you know. Uh, it, Facebook's not going to cut it. I think you agree? I hope so, you know what I mean? Putting a little Facebook post on or Bible verse on Facebook isn't enough to reach the lost. They either want to hear it or, or they don't, and they just zip by those of us that are Christians that might push that stuff on Facebook. They don't care. Um, and so here, here's one example that I gave a, a week ago. Uh, but I was talking to a ministry leader in Harrisburg uh, who said he got a really nice handwritten card in the mail. And he opened it because we all open handwritten cards right away, right? You know, you get enough. Uh, how many political postcards did you get this week? I, I got enough I can start a bonfire, you know what I mean? I just got so many political postcards this week. But you get something handwritten. It kind of jumps out at you, right? They opened it. He opened it up. He read through it. It was from the Jehovah's Witnesses. Because the Jehovah's Witnesses are not, right now, going door to door. But they're sending out handwritten cards to people and handwritten letters to people and notes to people. That's, that's not a bad idea. You know, maybe there's some people we can send a, no, a letter to or a note to. Maybe there's some tracks we can get out. Maybe there's some door hangers we can hang. Maybe there's some phone calls we can make. You know, uh, I, I was telling, um, I mentioned this in Sunday school too. So I, again, if you were in Sunday school last week, you've heard some of this. But uh, my wife went to the hairdresser. And uh, hairdresser, you know, obviously they were closed for a long time. But now that they're open, the one that she goes to, one person at a time. It's, and and she, she doesn't have all of her employees right now. It's just her, and she's get, letting in one person at a time. So there's no interaction in there. It's just, but my wife said, you know, she had the undivided attention of her hairdresser. There's nobody else coming in, nobody else in there. Uh, open to talk about things, open to talk about things that they're going through and problems that they're dealing with. Very open. Why? Because it's just you and them. That, that's better than it was a month ago. Or I'm sorry, six months ago. So, you know, I, I, would, I would just challenge you. Just think about that tonight. I challenged Sunday school last week. I'm going to challenge you again this week. What can we do? How can we reach out? We're going to still come in contact with, with people. You know, I shared again last week, uh, um, uh, my, my four-year-old grandson, Mason, is just enamored by the Amazon man, the Amazon delivery truck. I mean, he's looking for it. He, wants, he looks at the boxes. You know, he wants to see the smile on the box. You know, it's Amazon. And uh, he was at our house Thursday for a while, and um, we, we heard the, the noise out. We heard the, the brakes out front, and Desi said to him, oh, Amazon's here. The truck's out there. You know, he wants to see the Amazon guy. He waves the Amazon guy. We, he's, we've actually talked to the Amazon guy. This guy knows that Mason, at four years old, aspires to be an Amazon delivery man. That's his lifelong goal at four, you know. That might change, but we'll take it for now, yeah. You know, uh, are you built, can we build a relationship with those people that visit our house? Because they are, they're coming. The oil delivery guy or the Amazon guy or the FedEx, whoever it is that's coming to our house. Maybe we're getting our groceries delivered from Giant or Wegman or <laughs> whoever. We're getting our, our, our groceries delivered. That, is that person coming to our house? Are we seeing them? Can we witness, you know, we're, we're seeing some people we didn't see before. Maybe there's opportunities there to give the gospel to people that, that are coming our way. I think, I think we need to be looking for it. I think we need to be expecting it. I shared a couple weeks ago, we were just cutting limbs down, cutting some trees down before we went away, and the neighbor came over, uh, one that I hadn't really met before, but came over to talk to us for a while and hadn't helped us for a while. You know, I began to build a relationship with someone I hadn't really met before, but we're all kind of maybe more stuck at home than we were used to before, and 
now we're starting to see people and meet people. I've had new neighbors move in. The house across the street from me sold last week. People moving in, people changing over. People that are coming our way that maybe we can be a witness to. Tell them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Give them a track, give them a done book, bake them a cake. What, you know what I mean? And give them something. Build a relationship there. What, what are those things that we can do? I think, I would hope that you could just think about that this week. I want you to think about that. Send me an email if you have a great idea. I'm not going to ask people, to, uh, I'm not going to call on you tonight, but think about that and, 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 and dwell on that. What can we do to be a witness? I, let me go back to the beginning. The Great Commission didn't change, right? Matthew 28 didn't say, go into all the world, unless you're dealing with COVID, then take a six-month sabbatical and then come. Now, he didn't tell us that, of course. People are still dying and going to hell. And so we need to be busy about the gospel however we can in the situation we come up against. We may have to come up with some innovative ways, new methods, new ideas, new, new, new avenues to be able to reach out to people. It's, it's, it's a challenge. I think every generation has dealt with some challenge. This is ours right now. So what can we do to be a lighthouse in our community in spite of the problems? The pastors in California will tell you people are hungrier now than ever before. And the state of California and the city of Los Angeles is so mad at John MacArthur because every time he opens his doors, the place is packed. It's packed. Because people are hungry for the word of God. People are hungry for the gospel. And there's places where the churches are closed right now. And, they're, you know, California would be our perfect example. Where the churches are closed, where the government is trying to keep them closed. People are in darkness. They're looking. They're searching. They're hungry for something. They're hungry for the hope that only Christ can give them. Let's pray.